Hi there. Um, firstly, I'm only five foot five, so I'm sitting up here instead of down there. Um, also, I do not need medical attention, so I'm going to stay sitting up here in case I fall over. So, hi. Um, so, today, last year I was here, um, I gave a talk about like where we're at in the power grid, how many utilities we have in the country, various things to do with sort of current state of how our grid is. Um, I decided to give a little more of an extreme version this year which is uh, essentially where we're at with renewable energy, what's going on with the grid, what our current trends are for modernization, not where we're at right now, but where we're going. Um, but I also have a quick question at the beginning. I have a choose your own adventure in here. I have two versions of this talk with a scenario at the end. One of the scenarios is about an inverter that we're calling Sunsplat. And imagine we, uh, I was calling it CrowdStriked, all of the inverters. Um, what would that look like? I've got a scenario to go through. The other one is what if we were to... Just yeah, sure. Is that better? Yeah. There we go. Um, nope. How's that? I'll stop flailing around. Thank you. Um, the other one was essentially if we lost all power in the eastern seaboard entirely and we had to black start our system, which is when we restart generators, we restart load, um, what does that look like in a modernized grid? So while I'm talking, at some point I'm going to give you a choice because there's not time for both and people are going to have to put up their hands and tell me which disastrous scenario you're going to have to look at. Um, so while I'm talking also, what I'm really talking about here is what I'm thinking about what people can do in this scenario is how do we raise the bar on the technical solutions we're trying to actually provide to the electric grid so we can have all of these futures? Um, how do we get companies to operate within reasonable bounds with these technologies? and learn good lessons about how to do this securely and still afford to do it. And how do we moderate how people think um, or talk? Um, fear, uncertainty and doubt in the electric grid is one of the key selling points for most of the technologies you'll see probably at some of the conferences here. Um, we like to say, oh, there's this vulnerability. It could cause the entirety of New York to lose all power. Um, a few weeks ago, someone said that about electric vehicles. They said 3,000 electric vehicles in um, Manhattan could cause the power grid to go out completely. I don't know where their parking spaces were to begin with. I don't know where these vehicles were, but we have got to stop this kind of fear, uncertainty and doubt and come up with moderate scenarios where we can actually operate through all of these things. So now for the catastrophe. Um, a few people have mentioned uh, climate change over the last few days or last few hours. Um, our planet is dying. Um, we are killing our planet. I'm, again, doesn't take me being a scientist or a doctor to say what that is. But Las Vegas in a few years will be unlivable. It will be too hot. We won't be able to live here. The scenario where the, if we don't have AC, we will just die is, is there. So um, if we keep going the direction we're going in the next few years, we're going to reach this 1.5 degree limit where um, essentially they will be completely unable to recover from this. Some of the solutions, about 28% of that problem comes from how we generate and use electricity. So one of the big solutions that's being pushed is renewable energy, and that's primarily what I'm gonna talk about today. So just current state of our grid. I actually grabbed this picture while we were talking just to see what the current state of outages were, like how many people don't have power today, because every day seems to be a new adventure and weather disasters also. Um, around 600,000 people in the country today don't have power. Um, to do with various storms. Um, you can see Florida's fairly affected by, I think it was Hurricane Barrel. Is that the right name? Don't know. Debbie. Um, Debbie was, Debbie. was it Barrel last week or? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay. Um, that also talks the number of weather events we're having that is I don't know the names anymore. Um, 600,000 people today don't have power. That, that's a lot. That's not a small number. Um, again, there's about 3,000 utilities. There's lots of things that can go into that, but um, usually we're, I've been used to seeing these graphs just be all blue in the last few years and it's unusual. We see whole states being a different color every day and that's kind of where we're at just now. But we are trying to solve that. Not all of this is caused by weather. Some of this is just an aging system. Some of this is increased load. There's many things that are going into this. Um, we've put about $1.2 billion, oh, sorry, I should say trillion, apologies, trillion dollars in the last three years into trying to modernize our electric system. Um, a large majority of that is going into renewable energy. Um, split in the country. Some people hate renewable energy. Some people love it. Some people change words like me to try and make people not hate it as much. Um, but 
there is a split in the country, but no matter what, we're past the point where this isn't going to happen. I've been working in this field for 20 years, mostly actually in renewable energy. It's, it's not going away. There's no amount of foot stomping that's going to do it. Um, there is misinformation everywhere. I've got a running joke here where um, in Texas, when they had uh, a ramp down in the evening, they referred to it as a surprise sunset, I think, which is strange because they were blaming the solar and wanted to say they wanted their coal back. Um, weather events are still our biggest threat. No matter what we say about in this presentation, weather events are still going to take our power more often in the next few years than anything cybersecurity will. Um, we also have insane load growth that I'll talk about in a minute, um, but we're still pretty reliable. Like as you look at it in the world, we, we're still in a room with power or lights on. We still rely on our power being on. We're not um, the least reliable country in the world. We're actually the most reliable country in the world for power delivery. That being said, we have challenges. So we are trying to clean this up. Um, referring to all of the presentations today, renewable energy is everywhere just now, or clean energy, whatever you want to call it. Um, if you look at agriculture from this morning, a lot of these um, different locations are looking at electric tractors, but also looking at agrivoltaics, which is where people are putting solar on top of their um, agricultural land as well. Um, water plants are looking at using solar and storage for backup generation as well. Again, we're talking about water right here. If you don't have power, you can't necessarily actually pump water. Um, so they use solar and storage as backup. Our communication sites are one of the main vendors for our communication site backup generators is Tesla, who are selling batteries. Um, we're putting it everywhere. Essentially, Walmart is now actually the biggest owner of solar in the country, which is kind of insane. But it's everywhere. Um, we're not getting away from it, it's here. But with that comes, this is now connected to every sector. It's not just our grid, it's now even the generators that are meant to back up the grid that are backing up every other sector as well that are related to this problem. But why am I worried about it? Um, well, firstly, why is it good? Let's go with that. I'll go with good things first. I'm trying not to be, I mean, as much as the previous talk was super interesting, I'm trying not to include as much death in this one. Just, <laughs> I can talk about death till the cows come home, but you know, trying to keep it a little bit on some of the, the good things that we're doing with renewable energy. Um, if you live in Texas, you've had about 17 different events in the past couple years that have involved batteries and energy storage ramping up super fast to try and save you from whatever was going on that day that may have been a surprise sunset, a failure of a natural gas generator, failure of wind. There's been a number of failures that batteries have saved a lot of people from. Again, I can talk about death here. Um, the first time ERCOT, Texas had a major failure, multiple people did die for various reasons because of lack of heating, um, things to do with them sitting in their garages. People do silly things when the power goes out and people do die because of that. California's also had many heat events. Remember I talked about it when really hot. During those heat events, um, batteries are giving these emergency discharge signals, meaning hey, by the way, we've got way too much load. We need you to absolutely discharge all of your generation right now onto the grid. And they're doing it and it works. Um, at this point, California has reached, I believe they're 100% clean, which includes many other things. But batteries are now becoming the single largest aggregate generator in California. So it's not an imaginary scenario anymore that this is happening. People are doing it. It's useful. It's actually really cool. I like it. I've worked on batteries a long time. Again, there are some challenges. But why is electricity and energy delivery a little different to other sectors? Um, when we talk about energy delivery, when we talk about um, generation assets, we're also talking about distributed assets. So I don't know how many people have solar in their home or batteries or an electric vehicle. You can show hands or just, cool. cool. Um, you don't necessarily control the water in your house and pump it back into the system. Uh, where the, the nice person who was talking about water earlier, um, do you pump water back into the system at all to supply your water? No, I'm hoping you don't. I really hope you don't. Well, like, you know. It's possible that nobody, the public wouldn't pump water. Yeah, so we don't necessarily regularly pump water back into our power, or to our uh, water system. In power generation, though, we're trying to put solar and storage on people's houses and then have them respond as a grid asset for the system. That means they're also responsible for that generator sitting on their house. So if there's a vulnerability in their inverter, if there's something wrong, they're the ones that are meant to fix it. So we're putting this on humans and humans are notoriously unreliable. 
Um, why there is a picture of bridge here, I use, the, I use water since that's been today. I like to use the bridge analogy of if you were told a bridge was going to fall down and you were told you need to drive your car across it to fix it, would you do that? Like, would a human go out there and go, I'm going to risk my life to, to drive across this bridge and make sure it stays standing? Most humans are not that stupid to begin with. Um, but we're doing that effectively on people's houses. We, in California last year, it might be two years ago, I'm getting old, um, they sent out an emergency alert that was similar to, hey, we're, we've got a major problem from the emergency alert system. First time they've done it, everyone's phones it was forced into basically said, you need to turn down your AC, you need to do something or grid is going to fail. It was a huge emergency at the time. Every other automatic action had failed. I, got this, I was living in California, I got the text message. Everyone's looking at it like, what, what? Why? This is usually for either lost children or some kind of massive weather event, usually a wildfire actually in California. And uh, basically it did actually work. The humans did do it that one time because they got that emergency alert. Next time they didn't because every time you send them this, if you send them it 17 times a year, they're going to stop responding. They want their AC. Nobody necessarily wants to sit in 87 degrees for two days because they're trying to save the electric grid. In particular, they don't want to sit there when they're in California where their electric rates are the highest in the country and they're wondering what they're paying for at this point because they're sitting in 87 degrees in their house. So it's one of the sectors where we're relying on humans to take an action to save the greater good. And as we've seen in recent years, humans are not necessarily that great, great as en masse at saving the larger population. Other trends that we're seeing, and this relates to my later talk, um, my later scenario is massive load increases everywhere. Um, just for reference, this will be a big impact on cybersecurity as well, because these new loads are going to be able to impact our system massively. And there have been vulnerabilities in these loads and how they operate. Um, I think I was trying to use an estimate of how much it actually is going to be um, by the year 2030. And given the accent, I was using six times Scotland's load as a whole will be added to our grid, which is huge, um, or 1.7 Virginia's. I was trying to use it in terms of states. Um, no one called Virginia is involved in this. It's the state of Virginia, but that's the size of the load that's going to be added from just data centers, from needing data, AI, all these cool things we're trying to do they all need a data center somewhere. And so that's a huge load increase. It's also a huge beginning of vulnerability in our system. It's also kind of a cycle. Um, we're telling people that modernization and cybersecurity now also need AI. That AI needs to go somewhere. Um, that's a data center. Yes, we're using it to create stupid pictures just now, but the, most of those AI locations need those data centers. We then need that data center to be served by the grid that we're trying to modernize that doesn't have enough power to serve the load. So we're using AI to keep going and we're in this enormous cycle of I'm not sure where it's going to end if we don't moderate this. Um, some key facts and figures about this whole new renewable energy supply chain. I'm going to give the spoiler. It's all from China. All of it. Every single piece of it. Um, I was asked a few months ago, and I'll talk about this event, to do an analysis of where one particular battery was across the country. Um, where is it all? I remember looking at it and I'm like, I'm not going to spend a million dollars of taxpayer money trying to work out everywhere where this system is in the country. That's ridiculous. I'm going to tell you it's 97% of the systems. And they're like, why are you answering like that? I was like, because it's probably 97% of the systems and I'd rather spend the money trying to fix this situation than spend the money trying to come up with a number when I know how many there are. So it's kind of this look of shock. Um, but even when we look at the number of vendors on this system, meaning the number of people whose vulnerabilities we possibly have to account for, there's at least 73 inverter manufacturers that can be used in the country that have passed all of the safety regulations, all of the requirements we have, 73 inverter manufacturers, and 2% of those are US-based. So that's not very many. Um, if you look at the top graph, these are the global inverter manufacturers. Again, we need inverters for almost every renewable energy site. Renewable energy is usually DC. We need to convert it to AC. Um, we need it for almost everything. When you hear inverter-based resources, this is what we're talking about. Um, the number one supplier in the world is still Huawei, so that's good. Um, followed by a number of other Chinese vendors who are essentially supplying the majority of our market currently. Um, we're in an interesting geopolitical climate right now. That's not necessarily a good solution for our grid in the US currently. 
Um, there's also about 80 plus battery vendors um, and none of those are made in America. So here we are. Um, again, the majority of these inverter vendors are actually doing decent work on quality of their systems. I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, but there's various features of the systems that lead to some, well, perceived and real insecurities to do with remote communications, how we patch. But this is my, are we shooting ourselves in the foot with all of this? Um, this is a graph from 2020. Um, it was in Bloomberg, I believe, and it was announced as the US is numbers is second in battery manufacturer in the world, and look how great we're doing. We're, we're, we're second, yep. We've been lapped eight times in Olympic terms, but you know, we're, we're second, well done. Um, there's, this isn't a race we're going to win at this point, not in the near future, not tomorrow, not if we took everything out. We're not going to win right now. We have not put the money into this. This manufacturing race is extremely far gone at this point. So we need to come up with other ways to work on this. This is just an unreasonable expectation that this country will somehow make up that much manufacture in the next three years. So this was kind of the, the I'll call it the canon event, but the set of events that led to me being very, very busy over the last few months. Um, around April 2023, uh, a large military base that's named on the screen launched their new battery project that they were very proud of. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, this lovely selfie was taken with the command of the of the the site. If you see the name behind their heads, one one piece of advice: if you don't want a lot of attention, don't take selfies with the Chinese battery in your military uniform because a few people are going to get upset. So they took this picture, and there's there began a series of things that were going on. Um, if you haven't seen this, it's kind of well known that Cattle, this battery company, are one are the biggest manufacturer in the world. They are well known for this in the renewable energy space. Turns out they weren't well known in the cyberspace and everyone was pretty worked up about this situation. Um, then we get on to, I believe, December 24 and uh, one of a very large utility that happened to be connected to there basically announced that they were removing that battery, disconnecting it, getting rid of all their batteries from the system. They will not have any more Chinese batteries connected to their system. Cool. They put out an RFP. Um, the RFP to find new batteries got no answers because, or it got answers, none of them were eligible for what the requirements are they'd put on there because people finally realized, by the way, guess where all of our supply chains from? It's inside, it's outside, it's everywhere. And so there's kind of a, a moment for everyone of our solution isn't we're gonna rip and replace this, this is a whole other plan. Um, around that time also in the new National Defense Authorization Act for FY24, there was 10 battery companies that were named. It was part of, in the middle of all of this, this has happened and that was part of it being removed. Those 10 battery companies make up our entire supply of batteries at this point. So um, essentially, if we all followed what was in there, it was going to be a complete stop of the energy transition, the stop of grid modernization, the stop of almost everything that we're working on. Um, again, um, DOD gets up and says to various people, no, we don't have any more of these batteries in our system, we're okay. Like three weeks later, I think it was Edwards Air Force Base then announced they just got their new large um, connected battery energy storage system online. They were using BYD batteries. That was another one on that list. Well done, guys. They're really good at publication here. I do not know who works in comms for these people, but they need to read like what's going on in history. Um, great. So now everyone's screaming for rip and replace. They're screaming in Congress. They're screaming all over the place. And we've got... In my job, we have utilities come and talk to us and different vendors to say, like, can you help us? How do we deal with this? And we're like, well, we're not going to help you rip and replace it. That's, that's ridiculous. You'll actually lose reliability. So roll on. We get to now um, a few, maybe about a month ago. Um, everyone remembers we did ban Huawei. We did lots of other things. They exited the U.S. inverter market, still became number one in the world. Um, during that time, essentially, we have DOD were told that you have to remove it from all of their systems. And about a month ago, they said, hey, can we get a waiver from that rip and replace order? Because uh, we can't actually remove them from all of our systems. So rip and, essentially, my summary here is rip and replace is a terrible plan from a cybersecurity perspective also, because we just can't do it because we'll lose power in various places. So great, let's build a supply chain here. How long is that going to take? We have put $30 billion into this already to build new systems, build power electronics here. It's going relatively well. One of the big things we need is chips. Um, so there's chips for America that is building just now, but it's not gonna be in time for the next few years or for the next 10 years. 
Um, the battery material was a lot of the focus. Critical Materials Act came in. Um, we then changed that, I think, um, SMA Solar has announced a very large inverter plant to be built in the US, but at the same time, Enphase, who's the other, this, they kind of make up the 2% of things that are made here. Um, Enphase actually announced they were going to close a plant here, which is the other big inverter manufacturer. And also um, SunPower, who was like the, the golden child of solar energy and manufacture for a very long time, they fell for bankruptcy, I believe, yesterday. So. Um, we're not gaining traction on this manufacturer. Again, this is not to make everyone sad. We're saying we have options, but we need to actually work at how people are going to apply these because building it here is not necessarily the solution. So just moving on, what are we actually seeing from technical risk on these systems? Like, why do we care that inverters are built in China? Um, well, we're seeing trends and vulnerability in these that are not great, um, and they're also very hard to fix. Whereas a US inverter company might stand up and say, Sure, we'll fix that vulnerability. Thank you for disclosing. The Chinese companies are not going to do that. So we're seeing weak credentials, persistent communications to home, home not being a US base. Um, there's lots of web page vulnerabilities with the applications. Essentially, these things have problems. They're getting better, but they have problems. There have also been ransomware attacks. Um, again, it's not necessarily shut down any power generation, but again, ransomware doesn't need to do that. Um, it's caused massive financial challenges with these. Um, remote monitoring has been lost in a number of cases. Again, we're seeing challenges. Um, there's been about 17 different events that we've seen in the past that are reported in the past um, four years, I believe. Um, and they're not getting better, they're speeding up. The FBI just released an announcement about, hey, by the way, people are targeting renewable energy. People finally worked out it's there. So technically, though, some of what makes these devices a bit of a risk is also a benefit to the system. We can't necessarily update firmware on these, um, you know, remotely. You can't go to millions and millions of devices and plug something in unless you're a crowd strike. Um, but yeah, <laughs> sorry, but you. Uh, there's, there's been problems. There have been inverters that have had software challenges that have meant they've had a shutdown or something has happened. Again, that wasn't a cyber problem. It was just a straight up software problem. Um, a lot of these things were fixed with a hot fix where they pushed software remotely to the devices so that they wouldn't have the same problem anymore. And so some things have been fixed with software changes. That's still a risk. Um, the other interesting issue is the quality of our battery cells. Again, remember I just said they're all from China. The quality has actually been increasing over the past few years. We used to have a problem with fires. Um, you see lots of pictures of battery fires. I say we used to because there haven't been as many. They're well publicized when they happen, but there haven't been as many nationally or globally. Um, and a lot of that is attributed to just improving the maturity of the supply chain. Funnily enough, it's attributed to a lot of these companies collecting data from all of their battery systems through other communications devices and improving the safety of their devices over time. So we're kind of stuck. If we ban these 10 companies or we ban other companies, we end up just going to another 10 that are popping up and they probably have a worse fire risk. We do have data that some of them do. So uh, we're kind of damned if we do, damned if we don't at this point because you know fire risk will be higher. Again, what do we do? Do we rip it all out and start again, or do we operate through this? Because we need to actually design this better future, but also exist with the supply chain we have currently, because we need to do both of these things to both help us generate power in a clean way so we don't end the world through climate change, but we also you know, have challenges with where things are coming from. So again, everything has its place. One of my messages of this was communication. Right now, if you follow any DOE or DHS things in the US, there's this kind of battle going on between secure by design and cyber informed engineering. Who's going to win? Both. They both need to win at this point. There's a solution for both. We can't necessarily tell a company in another country to do secure by design. We can secure around it. So how do we do things that people install these properly? Um, we have designed programs for this. Getting people to use them is a bit of a challenge. Again, I, I built this just to I explained for another presentation, um, how do we actually talk about integration of components? Um, how do we scale risk? Not everything can be done for every component. It depends on the criticality of where it is. Um, I mentioned earlier the different sectors that are getting batteries, renewable energy as backup generators. One of the big ones is actually hospitals. Rural hospitals in particular are funded. About 170 of them got money recently to install. 
batteries as backup generators with a goal that they would uh, remove their diesel generators over the next few years and be dependent on those batteries. So um, when you look at how they're going to buy those, they're going to be somewhere in the middle of this graph, be it fully Chinese supply or fully US supply. Um, there's no such thing as a fully US supplied device, so we're clear that's why there's a unicorn fully floating around on the right hand side. Um, but we do have solutions. I won't necessarily cover what all of them are. But again, my message is how do we get these out to people in a reasonable way, prioritize the right way so that people aren't just chasing down magical devices all over the place. Um, when people announced like, oh, hey, Volt Typhoon, you need to all go check this, you need to do this. There's utilities in the middle of the country that have diverted every single resource to we must solve this problem because we're going to be attacked in the near future. Every single resource on cybersecurity is diverted to this, which is about three people, which is not that many. But, um, well, that's true. Um, but there's, they're all focused on this. And in the end, there's these things coming at them from all angles that they're not seeing the whole picture because they got so hyper-focused on one message. So scaling solutions by criticality is one of the solutions we look at. Again, what are you actually trying to do with it? What's mission critical? What are the consequences before you install it? And how do we actually get there? Again, living with the enemy here, because uh, this is where we're at. Um, how do we get the best of both worlds? The enemy also being climate change. We do not want the world to end. We don't, don't want it to end for our children. Um, we are deploying solutions. There are solutions in place. This isn't impossible. This isn't a, solution, a system we cannot fix at this point. We can secure around most of the most consequential issues we can secure around. We can't get people to actually do it though. So this is what we're trying to do is how do we message this to people that they'll do the things that are simplest to get this done. We, we can deploy them. We can do secure by design for the future. We can cyber informed engineering it. We also need policy to use a lot of these. Um, we can't necessarily inspect all the devices that come into the country because the policy doesn't allow for it. We need policy. But communication matters here. This was something that I'd mentioned at the beginning. Um, we need people to be prioritized on the right things for the electric grid just now again. Most cases, weather is one of our biggest problems. Then prioritizing keeping the poles standing is actually kind of a big deal just now. Poles fall down all the time. They need to keep that up. They cannot divert all their resources. But it's a systemic problem. It's no individual component, no one solution, no one solution fits all. But communication is really a big deal. I'm gonna implore anyone to just talk to the engineers in the field about how they fix things. Um, I see a number of people talk about, oh, if this cyber event happens, this whole substation is going to blow up. I'm like, there's fuses. Like, there's things in the substations that tend to protect us from the biggest events, and it stops people looking at the other events that would be helpful. But So raising the bar in technical communication is my request to everyone. But again, I wanted to do this at the end. I'm not sure how much time I have. Um, sorry, just checking. He told me to speed up, so <laughs> kidding. So I did a choose your own slightly upsetting adventure because I don't think I can cover both of them. I called it slightly upsetting. They're not as upsetting as they could be. There's no one doing CPR here. Um, but I gave two. So I want to vote here of what if we crowd striked millions of inverters? What would that look like? Talking through an exercise that I'd done before. And the second one is what if we uh, needed to black start the entire East? Okay. And, you know, I said the word black start. So dim and gloom. Okay, I'll go to this one. So I presented this last year. Um, it was talking about a real event that happened in Livermore in California, where we'd had um, essentially a massive lightning storm. It was 100 degrees in California. Um, California system operator had called this rolling blackout. Um, we'd lost a large power transformer. Hey, guess what? Those are all from China also. So it was going to take months for us to get a new one. Um, the wastewater plant had also failed. Livermore was falling apart at this point. Livermore, who, which also um, supplies, I believe, to a military base and a large national lab that I happened to work at, at the time. The fire that had been triggered by the lightning event had also started to burn. It became the largest fire. Well, it might now not I could say largest fire yet, since I think this year there had been a larger one than that one. It was called the uh, Lightning Complex Fires in California. It took out a lot of things. Um, but at one point it turned round, wind is weird in Northern California and started to actually head straight for a national lab and a military base. And so we were kind of in the middle of how are we gonna evacuate this system? How are we actually gonna do things? 
Something I didn't talk about last year was there's two large supercomputers sitting there. And one of the things that was happening is we'd had to ramp down all of the supercomputers because, hey, by the way, we're losing power. You need to get rid of your giant large load bank that's sitting on the system. Also meant we had to co-op a bunch of actual analyses that was going on that was a national security thing. Um, everything had to be moved because we had to ramp down analyses that was going on for other things because the computer was needing to be turned off. Um, so yeah, it was impacting other things again. And then my running joke was that at some point in that summer, they also announced we're going to get rid of all gas vehicles in California. Um, you're going to only have electric vehicles. People in this town that were evacuating hadn't had power for three days. And they're like, what, what you're going to evacuate a town from a fire when we've got all electric vehicles that haven't had power for three days? Like you're going to bring us a school bus? Like what's happening? So. It was a really kind of strange event that was happening, but it made me think about what I'm talking about here. Like, what if we add cyber? Um, so from a Black Star scenario, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, so I'm happy. Um, black Star is when we've, we, everything is black. We've lost power in large sections of the grid. We've lost large major generators. Um, effectively, when we talk about, we're usually talking about the whole country, but let's consider just sort of one large section of the country to make it less dramatic. What happens when that has, it has happened, we have had to do black start scenarios. We do plan for it in the electric system. We don't necessarily plan normally for cyber to be part of that scenario. So we're all there. Um, we ran exercises in the last few years. One's called Liberty Eclipse. There's Grid X. We now do plan for cyber to be there, but it's still not necessarily as embedded in the field crews and people that will be doing the work. Um, when we ran an exercise in, I believe, Plum Island um, a few years ago for a lip, it's not called Liberty Eclipse anymore, but we ran an exercise. One of the first things that happened is one of the field crew that was out there trying to simulate this black start happening with cybersecurity. We told them the hospital, funnily enough, was not generating. Their goal was they had to get power back on for the hospital in this exercise. This field crew guy runs out and he's just basically screaming at everyone because he was angry. Um, they tend to get that way sometimes. But he was determined that his one mission was that hospital needs to come on. So he started to do the things to make sure that would happen because he wanted to win the exercise also. <laughs> so he was doing those things. And there was a, a vulnerability embedded in one of the relays that was basically triggered by him turning it back on to brick everything that was related to it. So essentially he bricked half the system by doing this. And we're trying to explain, you're, you need to bring a cyber person with you to do this now. If we think it was a cyber attack, you should probably bring someone with you. Okay, don't let them touch the wires, but like they can come with you. It's okay. Like they, they just, they can be trained. Don't worry about them. But that was one of the big lessons learned is they need people to come with them to do that. If we do suspect there's anything to do with cybersecurity involved here, because people are mean. And so when we have a black start normally, I say normally, but it's a, it's a pretty bad event. A field crew will have to go out and assess damage. It's probably caused by some form of damage at this point. The people in the bucket trucks are staged. Um, if anyone works with David, he does a lot of this on helping stage for large weather events. Um, they'll be staged outside. Um, outside the weather event, they will go out and they will determine how much is damaged, what they need to fix, what they need to do, and, and do an instant response plan to get things back online. They then go back through, they kind of, they reconnect the big lines and generators. They go through any major load blocks and then they start restoring and resynchronizing all of these big things together. Just imagine resynchronizing lots of things in little islands until they all talk to each other and match up properly. It takes up quite a while. It can take days for them to pull this back up depending on the size. Um, so it's a big deal. When they need equipment, there's usually these large yards of transformers sitting there. Um, we like to think of transformers as this kind of mysterious thing. There's yards of them sitting around. You can find them. They're just sitting everywhere. Um, you'll find transformer yards, pole yards. They have equipment staged. They know how to do this. This isn't a mystery. It's not a problem. We know how to do it now. So my scenario I wanted to bring it all together with is our future of all the things I've talked about, of everything that's now integrated into the system and what that means. At one point, we will not be able to go back to this being a manual system. There will be no option for us to manually restart all of these things. We'll be stuck. I say stuck. It will be good, but we'll have a more digitized, automated system. So um, I had a picture at the beginning of the robot in the substation, one of those robot dogs. That is a real thing now. They're sending robot dogs into substations. It's kind of weird. Um, but they that's for safety as well. They can go in and be less likely to be hurt by something in that substation. So 
They also can collect more data. They can do a lot more things. They can assess what's going on quickly, automatically. Okay, so imagine our robot dogs are running around connect, collecting all this data of, we've had the power outage, assume it's happened. We don't know necessarily all what's caused it. There have been a number of cyber events linked with weather events, so we have to deal with both. Um, so they're running around their robot dogs. Okay, where are they gonna send their data to actually do the assessment? If they don't have power in that whole area, have they worked out a plan that that data is gonna go to some other data center somewhere across the country? We do a plan with that in different ways. What if the whole country wasn't there? Okay, how do they even communicate that data out to do this AI assessment of what's actually damaged and come up with a solution? Again, I'm not clear right now, but imagine also in a very practical way, the batteries on that robot need to be charged for at least three days. Does everyone plan their robot dogs are charged for three days so that we can actually get the data to restore the system? Again, we then need cyber assessments and root cause analysis. Um, great, again, still needs data to do that. So how do we get those teams together? We again need the data centers for processing and damage. We need them for the remediation tools. We also need communication systems with throughput capability that can actually take that data and do something with it. Um, and those need backup generators on them also, which might also be those batteries and those solar plants that we're talking about that may have cyber risk on them. So who goes out and checks those are okay. Um, again, we need to determine where the load is from a locational priority, um, depending on the size of this national outage we're talking about. Did that data center that we need to use have backup generations that's actually working that wasn't that battery that we're worried about that we're now talking about? Maybe, maybe not. Um, we can start going through other things at this point. There's things also like, okay, we need an additional yard for power electronics and technicians that are going to work on all of these things because we need digital systems to be installed. And that isn't the field crew who are hauling the wires around normally. That's a different set of people, people that look more like everyone in this room than the normal field crew. Again, field crew can look like anything. I have been field crew, but normally they're a set, set type of people working on big wires. So do they have an additional yard for those things? Again, we've got the physical equipment needs, and then we can go out to things like actually dispatching these cyber and physical teams together. So are those cyber people trained to be going into substations, going to work together on these things? Um, do they know not to lick the wires? I hate to say this, it's a running joke for me. I'm both of these things, we don't know. I don't trust a lot of people in substations, so there's that. So can we dispatch them together? Um, and then again, can we call in cyber mutual assistance? This is something that exists in the country now, but that's when we would start to need that. We don't just need storm assistance, which is well done. We need cyber assistance. Do we have enough people to even turn up to do this? And after that, we do get to the sort of resyncing the grid. Imagine we've got through all of these situations, trying not to scare everyone, but then we also need to resync all the cloud, the data, the analyses, everything else together. So the system stands back up in a way that is actually functional. I'm mildly terrified by this scenario. I'm not sure. I, I'm excited as a scientist that gets to do research on how these things will work on future because it's a problem I don't think is solved. But I'm looking at this kind of big picture scenario as that's a lot of things to deal with when right now it's really kind of da 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 turn on the lights. So yeah, um, we've got some interesting challenges that are all linked together. Um, again, don't have solutions for all of them. Looking for help on those things and ideas and sort of reasonable thoughts of how we're going to put together this sort of future grid as well so that everything we've talked about today can still have power. There's another adventure, but I'm going to stop there because I think I'm getting the look of, okay, it's seven o'clock nearly. <laughs> but uh, any questions, discussion? Is everyone terrified? I was hoping for that. <laughs> Okay, I see some questions and I will run to you carefully without tripping. Hmm? Mm. The crowd strike one? Okay, fine. Um, about battery suppliers all coming from China, are there, uh, is it a financial incentive problem? Is that why like GE doesn't want to do it or, or, or even like uh, Siemens or one of our, one of the many amazing companies in Europe? So it's partially a material problem to begin with because shipping material across the world is expensive. So using the material to make the batteries in the country it's being bought from is one thing. And um, again, it's incentive as well. We 
We didn't incentivize this 10 years ago. We incentivized cheap, high volume products being created for the future, which is good because it meant we got there. Um, but GE, Siemens, big companies are developing things here. It's just, it's going to take a while. And not every component is necessarily the priority, if that makes sense. I would prioritize inverters before I'd prioritize battery cells, put it that way. So. All right. So the chair of the session has requested that we go through our next scenario. And after we do that, then we'll do some questions. OK. So this is the one I called, what if we crowd strike all the inverters? <laughs> so it's the best way for me to describe the scenario of what's happening. Um, I ran a small tabletop, or a beginning of a tabletop at the S4 conference last year that was addressing some of this, because I wanted to put together a team of people in a room that included a utility, an inverter manufacturer, an aggregator, someone that owns all of these distributed resources, a group of people and cyber teams to say like, what if this happened? Didn't realize something like CrowdStrike would give me a great example for this later on, but here we are. Um, and so the scenario I'd presented was, and I wanted people to think about, was this fictional aggregator, someone that aggregates millions of devices in the country, all of your behind the meter resources that are on your houses, one of ways financially they survive doing that is they aggregate them and sell that all back to the market and you, you get to benefit from that thing on your house generating renewable energy. So the scenario I presented was, imagine we have that very hot California day um, where the grid is strained, we're having some challenges. Um, the independent system operator in California is calling for this conservation. They're sending you the text messages that you're ignoring and they're asking for emergency discharges. Um, they're saying that there's a virtual power plant there as well, which means, a set, well, it really doesn't mean anything. It's a new buzzword that they're using. But there's a virtual power plant, a cluster of resources operating together in one city, and they're, they're concerned that there's ag this aggregator that has a challenge. I called them Aurora Power, if you get the joke, for me being from Idaho National Lab, then haha. -ha. But um, they're a fictional aggregator. So. When I ran this, it wasn't called Sunsplat. I'm really proud of this. And wow. somebody said this should be called the Sunsplat inverter. So we created a picture that is now the Sunsplat scenario, um, which was imagine those, these millions of inverters across the country have a vulnerability that's been identified. They've said it's, it's really bad. It's level 10 CVSS. It's published for all of them. We know it's there. It, cause, it causes a problem through your entire fleet of inverters, which is millions of devices. Great. Um, the brick of all those devices, imagine that exploit could actually cause a brick of the device or just turn it off. So both the market they're participating in and potentially the grid would be impacted by the loss of this generator that's essentially across the whole country. But there's millions and millions and millions of devices. It's not just one. So that brick would cost an aggregator $26 million to actually fix, which in lots of aggregator cases could be bankruptcy. So you just lose the support of them. Um, and then Sunsplat, the inverter company, has said, well, the latest firmware is possibly the issue. Funnily enough, imagine that company Sunsplat is actually a Chinese company. They're trying to communicate with a Chinese company about a vulnerability that was disclosed in the US that somebody wasn't particularly happy about being disclosed. But they've identified a fix. Um, the fix is pushing firmware to all of the devices um, remotely from the main aggregation point or from the manufacturer. Um, they think comms will be maintained while doing that. They need to do that. The reboot will take 10 minutes. It'll take five minutes to reconnect. Great, we've got a solution. What do we do then? So this was a scenario we presented to all of this group, um, be it a utility, an aggregator, everyone involved. And everyone kind of just looked at us like, what do you think would happen? I'm like, what? Like not a single person in the room had a version of this story that seemed to make sense for how we would fix this. Um, a bunch of people are kind of looking like the utilities like, well, it's nothing to do with us. I'm like, what? And then the, the aggregator's also looking at me like, oh, that sounds bad. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And the, they were the cyber team and they're like, we don't want to deal with this. I was like, yeah, it doesn't sound good. So basically, uh, no one seemed to know who would be fully responsible for this. And I think this is one of the, the bigger challenges. We have had vulnerabilities in these systems. So, um, so that was the scenario presented. And again, we ran through this step by step and I made it slightly worse each time. And I'm not sure I included the last slide. But I made it slightly worse each time. So the scenario we presented at the end of this was, OK, they pushed out. Everyone panicked, put it that way. We got two days into this. People were starting to exploit that vulnerability that was being talked about. It was causing problems. 
they knew it was happening and there was a panic because somebody said, this is going to take down the whole grid, you need to fix it now. I'll call one of the cyber companies, said, by the way, we're going to cause an outage in the whole system, we can fix this, but you need to push it immediately. So imagine that company did, they pushed out to everything all at the same time. That's never happened, right? No, no. Um, yes, yeah, so that's why I'm calling this the crowd strike scenario. So imagine it then bricked everything. Every single system needed a manual reboot. That was one scenario and they were like, could that happen? I was like, technically it kind of did happen once. Um, a firmware push was done in a, to an island, we'll say, and it did cause a whole bunch of problems because it was pushed and the firmware didn't work right. So to every single inverter on one island. So again, I'm looking for people to, to volunteer scenarios here, but we were trying to work out, so, so who's locally responsible? Like physically, where are those inverters at? Who's responsible for this? Like, who needs to go and do the restart of these systems or find out a way to plug in some USB and reboot this system? Because um, they need them. They can't just replace them all. One scenario I did present was there was a cluster of devices that worked together that did cause a power outage. Because they were working together, sitting in one area, there was no, it was a monoculture of <laughs> inverters sitting there. Imagine there was actually a power outage caused by that. They blew some fuses, very hot day, someone died, somebody had medical devices there. Who's responsible for that? Like medical devices in your home, who's responsible for somebody died because we pushed a firmware out? Yet how do we do this mass reboot? That's the other, like, how, do you go and ask every homeowner to do it? Do you ask them to restart it 16 times and hope for the best? Like what's the... What is the scenario here? Because I don't know that many homeowners that would go and do this. So is their cyber teams going to come out to 25 million endpoints to go sort this? Um, if anyone did see the Delta staff flying around to different airports last week, that's not a great scenario either. So that's, again, there are ways to do this, but we just don't have a plan. Um, instant communications, who actually talks to each other? like? Is it between the aggregator, distribution utility, the ele electricians, law enforcement? Who's, who's dealing with this? Um, how do we know it isn't a bigger issue? Is the distribution utility now responsible because they blew the fuses? Um, what would be expected of this inverter manufacturer? Like, what are they expected to do? Do they write letters to the news? Do they turn up to fix it? And then what can we actually do? What regulatory or legal requirements could actually fix this? So these are the kind of questions I mean, again, I'm going to ask you all questions. If you have ideas or thoughts on this, I'd love to hear it because the group of intelligent people that were in that room all kind of gave us a look of, uh, and some people made some nice pictures of sunsplat inverters for me, so that was nice. But, but I think. I was just curious about Comscore. Yeah. Um, Comscore is So the general... Can you repeat the question quickly? What happens with communications essentially during a black start? Do we have all loss of comms? How do we restart that if we need it? Um, right now, the hope is our communication stars would still be up because we'd have backup generators attached to all of the comm stars. There are alternate solutions as well. There's things to do with radios, relays. There are solutions for communications. And again, a lot of them depend on those backup generators also working at the same time. So um, there are solutions, a bit. Again, it depends is the answer, I think. Is. And I will say if I stare at you, I am slightly deaf, so masks make it really hard for me. So uh, you don't need to take off your mask, I just, um, if I stare at you, it's. So I put my question, oh. my question is, why isn't this more common? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, for instance, let's say, you know, the heat event. Let's say, I'm going to throw out names. Let's say every Ecobee or every Nest all of a sudden glitched and turned on the heat pumps or something like that. That could cause this kind of thing. We've, it does, it's not just the inverters that have this problem, right? There's many other things at the, at the load end that have this. Are we, I mean... What's in there to stop that right now? And are we seeing that happen and we're just not hearing about it? There's various safety controls in place right now that some of them just won't go past a certain temperature level. There's manual 
re responses. So on inverters, for example, one thing someone said once was, oh, could they make the voltage go super high and everywhere and just cause a fire? Technically, we have over-voltage protection that should work separately. So there are alternate protections in place for a lot of it, but it doesn't mean they're always going to work as we keep growing this and sort of start to lose those manual protections as well. That's why when I say we're not quite there yet, but we have time, it's because those manual protections are still in place just now. But as we get to massive amounts of renewable energy, load control, all those things, those controls start to become a bit more fuzzy as well. So because we start to need those to be automated as well. Like the manual protections need to change based on other things at that point, so. Yeah, I'm wondering how much were state agencies involved in this? Because this is the type of scenario where the National Guard, state militias, local law enforcement, FEMA, would be rolled out. And were they involved in the exercise and did they have any, yes. any input? Yes, they were sitting there and they said they wouldn't know what to do with the inverters and they'd have to have training in how to do those things. They, it's, they weren't sure what they would be touching from an electrical standpoint. The training wasn't there yet. There also isn't necessarily all of the powers in every state to have that happen and get those controls there. Um, the other thing from small utilities in particular, the person that is National Guard or state and local responsible is often the single cyber person also sitting in that utility. So there's in the very small ones. So there's kind of a weird catch-22 for them in a lot of this as well. So yes, there are people that know those things exist and can know how to make them action, but they were still, we um, actually, when we ran the Plum Island exercises as well, we had a lot of National Guard members there. There was kits made that were meant to train people in how do you go into a substation and plug in things in the right place and don't touch the wires, basically. Um, that still needs to happen nationally. It's not there yet. So can get there. That's a good solution, but we need the training to be there, I think. So just want to make a comment on um, some of the conversation we've been talking about right now. Sorry, it's right here. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And, like and, and there is a um, vast lack of understanding with some of the process, right? You know, in this room, if I bring out like DR, BIA, BCP, mm -hmm. right? So but business, you know, impact is that assessment or analysis or, you know, business continuity plan, right? All those exist, right? How many people are actually from a cyber perspective put into, uh, you know, focus on those areas? Having those organization, you know, done a BIA, having a solid, you know, DR disaster recovery plan being established and, and really put on the focus and, and looking at this change as a non technical problem, but also a business problem. How can we get the business side come in to work together? And because it's very difficult if we just deploying solutions and just turn that into a technology problem rather than a process and uh, a policy uh, change, right? That's true. No, I, I agree that should be in people's business continuity, oh, business continuity and in their plans. Um, that's, that's one of the I don't say simple, but that's one of the solutions I just, I, I hope to try and communicate to people. It should be there for future, so. So so now that they know that they have a problem, do you know if anybody, if these companies have started to work on a solution? At least two or three have that came to talk to us afterwards. <laughs> um, um, there are plans, there are things that are changing they're trying, but there's ones that will never, like 10 of those inverter companies are never gonna come to work with a US national laboratory on how to fix their inverter vulnerabilities. So there's choices of how we're gonna do this, I think is the. Oh. So uh, this will be our last question and then we're gonna talk a little bit about tomorrow. Yeah, thanks. Um, I really kind of hesitate to bring this up as a potential solution because- it Sounds like a great question. <laughs> but, all right, so I believe Underwriters Laboratories has requirements for testing, you know, uh, they have re requirements on uh, inverter safety. Um, so now I'm thinking about things like, not just like cybersecurity requirements, but now like, maybe having some testing requirements that show like the reliability of firmware updates. Cause if it's got, if it, if you need to do a firmware update, 
maybe there needs to be yeah, I really I really hate to bring this up but you know some sort of like testing regimen where they actually bring you know they run multiple firmware updates and put in like various like fault scenarios and make sure that they can recover cor correctly I know this is something that we've kind of like foisted on the private sector to you know we want the, the manu device manufacturer to do all that stuff but in the lieu, in lieu of the fact that they're not I don't know it's, it's just a thought so UL 1741, I hate that I know these numbers, I really do, um, is the safety UL test testing we have for inverters. Interestingly, right now, we can certify Chinese companies and other companies to do that testing. So from a safety standpoint, I that's great. Testing their things in situ is a good idea, like doing this that right way. From a cyber perspective, given geopolitical concerns, we do have something being developed called UL 2941 that is a... Um, it's the beginning of a requirement, whether I believe in it right now or whether I believe it's reasonable. That's a whole other personal opinion. It's in development. It will be something that could do that. Um, my personal opinion right now is we need to make sure that's tested in the right places where we can certify the testing itself as opposed to just certify the device, if that makes sense. But there are, that is, testing these things again, how do you persuade some of these companies to test it without we need a regulatory requirement to do that as well which will increase costs which will yeah is a cycle of things so yep okay Thank um you. please join me in thanking dr emma thank you doctor